So while you're uh, sharing, uh, I'm just checking that uh, this sound is working for you. Uh, I'm speaking in a okay speed. The microphone is working. Is it? Yes. Okay, excellent. Yeah. Yes, it is my profile. It's my um, uh, bio, actually. If you change the uh, abstract uh, on the URL to bio, uh, as in B-I-O uh, dot T-X-T, uh, you will see a more traditional profile like audrey.org and then bio.txt. Yeah. Yeah, B I O. That, that, that was, you, you got it. That, that was correct. Yes. Uh, this is the, the more traditional one. Uh, it's not a poem. Um, it doesn't rhyme, uh, but the good thing is it's in three languages. It's not 15 languages, uh, but if you want to contribute uh, more translations, I'm always happy um, to post it here. Now, uh, the action word uh, here is the last word, the fork, the government. Right. So in the last line, uh, when I said, in the social sector, Audrey actively contributes to G0V or Gov0, a vibrant community focusing on creating tools for the civil society with the call to fork the government. The operative word is fork. Now, fork means like a fork in a road. Uh, in software development, you can fork a project without writing it off. So it's fundamentally different from individual to individual competition. In a competition, you're filling the same niche, but with a very different approach. But to fork means to inherit everything that there is, but take it to a different direction. So if you do not like, for example, how the government presents our budgets, or how the government handles regulatory discussions, or how the government handles the pandemic, uh, you're free to fork whatever service there is in a way that does not violate copyright, because we do not hold any copyright restrictions, and then take it to a different road and uh, innovate uh, from the grassroots, from what we call the social sector. And then uh, my role as digital minister is to merge the fork, meaning that whenever the citizens have a better idea of how to distribute the mask, how to vaccinate people, how to do contact tracing, their local approaches of maybe 500 people who tried it can be scaled to 5 million people and then 20 million people in a matter of a week or two. And so my role is just to make this scaling out the innovation, scaling up the innovation as smooth as possible to facilitate the fork and merge. I hope that answers your question about how to read my bio. Yeah, certainly. So uh, I'm digital minister in charge of social innovation, youth engagement, and open government. Uh, I have a job description uh, that I pinned on my Twitter that you have probably already read, uh, but it's very short anyway, uh, so I will uh, read it again. Uh, my job description goes like this. Uh, when we see the Internet of Things, let's make it an Internet of Beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that a singularity is near, let's always remember the plurality is here. So my role as the digital minister is to connect the people to the people, which is to me what digital means, and not just IT, which is connecting machines to machines. Whenever there is an emerging situation in Taiwan, it could be um, the legalization of Uber and ride sharing, it could be countering the infodemic, the disinformation crisis, the pandemic, and so on. I make sure that all the stakeholders who enjoy the freedom of speech and assembly and so on can band together, meet 
together, face to face, or across the internet, to discover the facts together, share their feelings together, and then develop pro-social, social media, where those feelings, instead of polarizing, converge together into workable ideas that we then regulate uh, into a co-created agenda. And this agenda, for example, on how Uber should be legalized, uh, we gather this into the public digital innovation space, which is my office, and using uh, the principles of radical transparency, posting all the lobbyists and journalists' ideas online, a shared infrastructure uh, of cybersecurity and co-creation across the different silos in the government. We make sure that we work with the people, not just for the people. So those innovations that take care of the most people's feelings can become public policy again in a matter of weeks. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Um Certainly. Um, so uh, in the near term, uh, my role at the moment uh, is to set up the Ministry of Digital Affairs, or MODA, uh, which would uh, be set up in Q3 uh, this year. And in MODA, uh, we bring together what's previously uh, belonging to different ministries in Taiwan, for example, the um, Com Commission of Communication, uh, National Development Council, um, National Economic uh, Affairs uh, Ministry, uh, uh, and the Department of Cybersecurity, uh, and so on, Ministry of Transportation and Communication, anything digital um, instead of dispersed uh, within different ministries and connected together in horizontal ways. We will also now have a ministry of um, beginning around 300 and soon to be almost a thousand uh, people connecting those previous silos together into a new ministry. So that's my uh, role for this year is to set up this ministry. And then and the ministry is pre preparing us uh, to enhance two things. One is the resilience uh, of our infrastructure. As you can see, during the pandemic, we have set up extremely efficient infrastructures, for example, SMS-based contact tracing, uh, where people do not have to download any app. They just point their phone to a QR code, self-service printed, uh, and then it, without compromising their privacy, uh, the random code is stored in the telecoms and then the contact tracing. People can restore uh, this whereabouts for the past four weeks without compromising individuals' privacy because for the telecoms, venues, and so on, they do not actually have the access to the complete picture. For them, it's just random code just gibberish, right? So this kind of privacy enhancing technologies pave the way of the kind of um, data altruism, data coalition, the kind of data sharing that we must enable in times of emergency like the pandemic. And in Taiwan, we have a lot of emergencies, right? Earthquake, uh, typhoons, not to mention other geopolitical ones. So we need to make sure that this kind of reliable, resilient infrastructure is there, no matter what kind of um, incoming situation uh, that we're faced with. Uh, so this is for the maybe next uh, two or three years. And the other thing is that this democratic model of co-creation, we want to scale it up and out so that it serves as a model, what we call the Taiwan model, so that we can use it to also uh, work on climate issues, uh, work on other issues requiring international coordination, uh, and then uh, establish this as a new norm, uh, not necessarily best practice, Practice, but certainly sometimes a better practice uh, to counter the emergent uh, situation that requires a more multi-stakeholder and multilateral communications. And my uh, contribution to the Summit for Democracy is largely the idea that we need to build the digital public infrastructures together uh, in the international community. So that's also for the next three to five years horizon. And then for the next eight to 10 years, of course, the Sustainable Development Goals, meeting those goals uh, is uh, our shared uh, priority. And then after that, I think I do not pretend uh, to predict the future. So I just want to be good enough and uh, leave more room uh, for the future generations to improvise. That is to say, we do not uh, over-design things uh, so as to uh, foreclose possibility for next generations. Uh, we want to 
plurality, that is to say, the people who are closer to the future to enjoy the full freedom of um, innovating using the kind of Lego blocks that we're building now, the infrastructure that we're building now, instead of over concentrating decision making power to just a few uh, algorithm rule makers or to, uh, for example, um, go for social harmony uh, and that uh, makes uh, it less likely for people to innovate because uh, there's just this one size fits all top down approach and so on. So we want to enable as many co creators as possible and also empower their communities. That's for the next uh, 20 or so years. Yeah, uh, that's a really good question. Uh, what makes me happy uh, is, as I mentioned, a good enough consensus. So it's not um, perfect, right? Uh, to aim for a perfect consensus often means that people with the most time or the most privilege and so on uh, dominate the discussion uh, and take away the kind of uh, spontaneity uh, on the newcomers or future generations. So I'm at my happiest when everyone in the room, although of different positions, uh, after gathering together uh, and share this feeling that uh, we can all live with it. So this, this feeling of just good enough, we can live with it, uh, that is when I am the happiest. So conversely, uh, I am least happy uh, when uh, people have to obey uh, the top-down uh, dictates without under, understanding why, when people only follow the orders, the what of policies, without any way to hold uh, the powers uh, to account, uh, unable to speak uh, truth to power. So uh, when people are muted, uh, that means that I'm the least uh, happy. So I'm happiest when we unmute ourselves and preferably share our host rights. Uh, because the Tao Te Ching literally says um, that the way you can go is not the real way, the name you can say is not the real name. Uh, so mm -hmm. I, I can't uh, really define uh, Taoism, uh, but I can um, make sure uh, that I share the a part of the Tao Te Ching that I uh, feel uh, the most uh, authentic uh, to my daily practitioner. Uh, so uh, here is uh, a chapter 11, I believe, the uses of not, and it goes like this, very short. Uh, it says, 30 spokes meet in a hub, like a wheel, right? Where the wheel isn't is where it's useful. Um, hollowed out, clay makes a pot, and where the pot's not is where it's useful. Uh, cut doors and windows to make a room. Where the room isn't, there's room for you. So the profit in what is, is in the use of what isn't. Okay, so for me, Taoism is focusing on the space, 
not the project, focusing um, on the collaboration, on the gathering, uh, not the violence, um, focusing on the possibilities, focusing um, on making sure that people share those possibilities uh, instead of any definite answer uh, to anything. Uh, so, like very shortly put, is to uh, cohabit uh, with problems uh, and be humble so that the solutions um, for now uh, may come from surprising places instead of from a brilliant individual genius. So that's my understanding of Taoism. Yes. Um, so again, to quote uh, stanza 17, uh, to give no trust is to get no trust. When the work is done right, with no fuss, no boasting, ordinary people say, oh, we did it. So that's collective intelligence. Uh, in my opinion, uh, when ordinary people can say, oh, it's the ordinary Taiwanese people that came up with all the counter-pandemic measures, that's really the only way. Uh, so the fatigue um, of counter-pandemic do not set in because people uh, always are creative. They create their own counter-pandemic measures uh, after each variant. And if we have imposed, as I mentioned, top-down ways without uh, explaining why, uh, then even the most strict lockdowns um, result in fatigue and people simply cannot maintain that for a very long time. Uh, so uh, from my experience encountering the pandemic and infodemic, uh, what we're doing in the public service is just to trust the citizens uh, because to give no trust is to get no trust. Uh, and then uh, when citizens see uh, all the real-time data or the APIs or the context of policy making, then we do not need to fuss or boast. The citizens come up with very effective, ingenious methods by themselves and ordinary people indeed say, oh, we did it. And unmute yourself. That's the operative word. Thank you. Uh, that's a great question. I did give a keynote uh, at an international conference on functional programming uh, for this uh, particular question, and that's an uh, entire keynote, so I'll try to condense my answer, but the full uh, program is online, Creative Commons. Um, to me, uh, in Taiwan, uh, we call software engineers instead uh, program designers. Uh, so uh, to us, is a designer profession, uh, not uh, necessarily an engineering profession. Uh, designers work with people, with society, uh, whereas engineering uh, discipline work with, I guess, engines. Uh, but that part is more and more um, taking, uh, being taken over by co-pilot and uh, other assistive intelligences. So I believe uh, in the future, um, computer programmers will move more and more uh, toward the design part. Now, my field uh, in computer science is programming language design. Uh, and in 
language design, what we're doing is to provide a set of thinking tools or abstractions. Uh, and the most important thing is to enable the people closest to the pain, the frontline programmers, uh, to redefine the language the way they see fit instead of uh, prescribing uh, for the foreseeable future how programs will look like. So uh, the languages that work on Haskell, uh, Raku, Previous Pro 6, and so on, all uh, stretch the limits of the domain specific languages and the programmers liberty in defining and sharing their own visions uh, of the world uh, and sharing it with the programming community and to me uh, this is exactly the same as uh, politics so I call myself a poetician uh, meaning that uh, my job description as you just heard is a poem uh, where I uh, aim to provide a set of abstractions that when followed uh, do not take uh, opportunities away from the people, uh, the public service and so on, who use those concepts, but rather uh, makes new concepts easier to generate. That is to say, if we say uh, the singularity is near, um, everybody is doomed, uh, AI will uh, terminate everybody's job, uh, then it prescribes a very narrow set of possible futures. But when we say, no, the plurality is here, uh, we must assist the society with technology, not the other way around. We must uh, hope uh, like eyeglasses or assistive intelligence is uh, accountable and so on. This by itself does not prescribe anything uh, certain, but rather it liberates uh, the public service uh, toward more ways of collaborating with people, exactly like a good set of abstractions and core libraries do uh, in uh, programming language design. So I would encourage fellow program designers to think on the design patterns, especially from a language design angle, and then uh, more often than not, you can take the kind of trainings that you are already very familiar with and share it uh, with the uh, public service community. Thank you. Certainly. Uh, the second question is easier, uh, so I'll, I'll just um, answer it right away. Uh, that was in 2014, where we uh, literally occupied the parliament. So nobody really invited us in. Uh, we did invite ourselves in. Uh, and then uh, at the time, the Taiwanese legislature uh, were fast-tracking without substantial deliberation uh, across trade service and trade uh, agreements uh, with Beijing. Uh, and because of that, people were very very worried uh, about this process. So they went in uh, into the parliament. The theory was that the legislator were on strike, right? They didn't uh, do their job in deliberating. So the people will uh, go there and deliberate for them. Now, uh, my role here is a assistive one. Uh, I and the GovZero people, the G0V people, helped to ensure that all the corners of the occupied parliament and the streets were live streamed, uh, transcribed, uh, translated, uh, and uh, basically facilitated by more than 20 NGOs. Uh, and so this uh, quelled the fear, uncertainty, and doubt during the Occupy. So for the three weeks, uh, it was thoroughly nonviolent, unlike 
other occupies. Uh, and so uh, the point here is that when people um, get into this co-creative mood, even the more complex aspects of the CSSTA, uh, for example, whether we want to allow uh, five at that time four G infrastructure from the PRC regime into our uh, infrastructure of telecommunication. Now that's a very hot topic, right? Uh, a few years down the line, but at that time uh, Taiwan was the only jurisdiction seriously deliberating it on the street. Uh, and so instead of politicizing that, we can imagine it's very easy to politicize that, uh, people actually did uh, a very down-to-earth uh, risk, systemic risk analysis uh, of how much it would cost to continuously uh, assess uh, whether the so-called private sector actors from the PRC regime uh, are uh, being captured right by non-market forces uh, from that regime. So um, the, the environment of live streaming of every uh, argument captured and then uh, posted online made it easier for millions of people to listen to each other, whereas before uh, it's only easy for one person to speak to millions of people, but not the other way around, right? So by scaling this listening uh, experience, we proved that uh, demonstration does not need to only to be protesting. It could also be a demonstration of demo, of showing that it's actually possible to get a set of coherent, good enough consensus, which were then ratified by the head of the parliament at the end of that Occupy. So it was a victory. So uh, at the end of 2014, all the mayoral candidates that supported this kind of deliberation gets elected, sometimes surprisingly, uh, and who didn't, didn't, right? So I was uh, invited along with other uh, Occupy activists uh, as reverse mentors to the cabinet where I kind of interned in the cabinet for a couple of years before being, I guess, promoted to full time uh, in the same office as a minister. So that's the story. Now, <laughs> going uh, back to, to your question. So exactly the same process, right? Every uh, day at 2 p.m., uh, the Taiwanese Center for Epidemic uh, Commands um, just go on live stream, uh, posting all the data. Uh, the past few weeks, we've seen Omicron down to uh, low single digits, right, per day uh, in local confirmed cases. Um, so people feel, I guess, uh, reasonably happy about that. Uh, but all the journalists and indeed anyone with a landline can call one nine two to our uh, toll free phone number to ask to their hearts content of the shortcomings that they see uh, on the CECC. So when the clarifications, when the signs spreads faster than rumors, exactly as we discovered during the Sunflower Occupy, uh, there was simply no room for disinformation and polarization uh, to spread. And in this pro-social environment, it's easy then to treat this as a um, kind of all out against the pandemic instead of one party against uh, the other. Hope that answers your question. Well, as you can see, uh, my title uh, is digitalministry.tw, uh, and this domain uh, happens to resolve no matter which jurisdiction you're in. So uh, as long as this takes place uh, uh, in cyberspace, that is to say on internet norms, we enjoy equal participation. Indeed, uh, during the Internet Governance Forum in Geneva a few years back, even though if I visit in person, I would not be able to enter with my passport due to well-known reasons, uh, I did send a telepresence robot uh, to speak on my behalf. Well, not representing me, representing me, I guess. <laughs> and so, uh, and, and indeed that, that worked, right? Uh, I went on the record, as uh, far as I know, the, the first one uh, on the record since 71 or something. Uh, on an official UN meeting. Uh, so the past couple years, the pandemic made it uh, not a, uh, a weird thing to do, but rather uh, even the General Assembly itself a couple years back uh, were uh, conducted over uh, video presence, right? Uh, so I think video conference in general uh, and the internet multi-stakeholderism in particular enabled us to share uh, our learnings in a much more uh, equal-footed approach. I hope that answers your question. Mm-hmm.
That's right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Uh, indeed, uh, that is the central uh, design criteria, right, for the kind of listening at scale. Uh, and as I shared, uh, the POLIS conversation uh, where we pioneered uh, its use in public service in 2015 uh, is now a digital public infrastructure, all the public servants can just launch uh, their own, like just like a Google form questionnaire, right? A wiki survey uh, to discover the shared feelings uh, among all um, in a way that's um, consistently controlling the trolls. That is to say, uh, trolling doesn't pay uh, on this pro-social uh, social media. Now, uh, for example, uh, right now, uh, I believe the join.gov.tw platform, which enjoys around, I don't know, 30 million uh, visits uh, per year in a uh, jurisdiction with 23 million people, so that's a lot. Uh, we're, we're now uh, asking people what they feel uh, about um, how to make a more safe and more friendly uh, water uh, sport uh, and uh, enjoy our uh, rivers and dams and things like that and and it's just posted a couple of days back uh, and people are already posting uh, their different feelings uh, and we uh, happen to be able to automatically uh, discover their shared uh, values despite their very different initial positions so this is very new this is literally just uh, just out and people can uh, see their participation how those four different sets of people nevertheless uh, share something in common. Uh, and so um, just by making sure that people see this as just something that they can do uh, from day to day, uh, we see this picture of democracy uh, very clearly that uh, the ideological statements uh, that divides people apart, people do not then spend calories on it. People agree to disagree uh, on, for example, some people think Uber is sharing economy and some people think it's gig economy. But actually, for more practical overlapping consensus. Most people agree with most other of their neighbors most of the time because it uh, sounds so mundane, uh, it's not newsworthy, so you simply do not see on the news. Uh, but on this pro-social platform, including Polis and Join, people can see it very clearly that we actually have a lot more in common than the antisocial corner of social media would uh, lead us think. And so just by sharing pictures after pictures of the common values, it enabled innovators to very easily identify find the uh, positive sum parts to innovate without leaving anyone behind. Hope that answered your question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is an excellent question. Uh, this is a social innovation lab uh, where I meet people, the social innovators, uh, every week. Uh, also, many of them are remote too. Uh, but whether it's remote or whether it's in person, uh, I make sure that uh, it's on the record uh, and it's in the Creative Commons. Um, and it's not necessarily just uh, Wednesday. Uh, like uh, yesterday, uh, I had a, a meeting uh, for a couple hours with uh, Steve Chen, the co-founder of YouTube, uh, who returned to Taiwan. Uh, to start his new startups uh, and he had a lot to say about the startup ecosystem and how uh, his thoughts on the algorithmic recommendations in YouTube uh, changed when he started to have kids and when he became a parent. But so it's a very nice conversation. Now uh, whether his ideas are good or not is not for me to judge. Rather my role is to ask the kind of questions that I think that are pertinent uh, to the issues at hand. For example, algorithmic
algorithmic transparency. Uh, and then uh, those ideas are posted as transcripts or YouTube videos and so on for the entire society to have a real conversation around. That is to say, I share my agenda setting power, but not necessarily decision making power. It's important because the lobbyists or the journalists and so on who visit me know that they are talking to the future generations. It will be on permanent record. And on this particular setting, it's very unlikely for them to speak anything selfish because it would really uh, look bad uh, for the descendants, right? The future generations, people tend to speak pro-socially. So again, that's the Taoism approach to make sure that the space itself is creative, not that me in particular is good in judgment. It's the crowd that makes the judgment. Of course, we can use uh, voting systems and police as a kind of voting system uh, to ensure that people can uh, collaborate uh, without explicit coordination, but that's just technical details. The main idea is just that it should be crowdsourced and shared. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, for the record, I think I'm on fiber optic line, uh, not 5G at this moment. Uh, but even if I am on 5G, this really uh, is uh, less carbon footprint compared to all of us flying somewhere, right? So it, uh, everything uh, is uh, in perspective of what kind of habits uh, people uh, turn into. So if you uh, turn a habit, like everybody flying to the same spot, uh, into something uh, that is less carbon intensive, uh, even though that by itself right, is um, still energy consuming, it is a net win. Uh, now, of course, uh, your point is valid in that if we form new habits that simply weren't there before and we become addicted to it and it happens to be energy consuming, for example, uh, burning energy for uh, non-fungible tokens, my favorite example, uh, then it does uh, actually carries a, a real environmental risk. Now, my, my answer is very simple. Uh, um, when we make sure that the carbon footprint, the externalities cannot be hidden, cannot be uh, shoved somewhere, and all the jurisdictions are committed to at least make it accountable, then uh, the jurisdictions or the practitioners that do not make it accountable will be uh, violating the norm, violating the default. Uh, people will assume uh, that they're hiding something and social sanctions may ensue, right? This is exactly the same model that we applied to other externalities, for example, tobacco control and things like that. So uh, what I'm trying to get at uh, is that nowadays uh, we need just to keep giving out accounts, not just for the large public listed companies, but small and medium enterprises too. And we also want to make sure that when they do so, they get aptly rewarded. In Taiwan, we have this program called Buying Power. If a small or medium enterprise is committed to reveal uh, their carbon footprint or other uh, GRI-like disclosure uh, that they're not uh, by law uh, required to do, right? only the public listed large companies are required, but if they conform to the same standards, then we do preferential uh, procurement. Uh, the supply chain that procures such uh, goods and services gets a award from me personally or from uh, their respective ministers and so on. And so when everybody gets this norm out, then it also uh, rewards individuals to also uh, look at their habits and then uh, remind each other uh, to uh, be more proper right, in our addictions and habits and so on. So I think I'm net 
optimistic uh, on the technology of the social change. I see the kind of like the open space technology, nonviolent communication, uh, whether incarnated digitally as polis or whether it's face to face uh, in a scenario workshop and so on. These are also technologies. These are habit making social technologies that are equally important as compared to the other industrial use of digital technologies to facilitate uh, change. Hope that answer your question. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, I, I can't say names. Uh, Facebook is a uh, really, really uh, what I had in mind when I say anti-social corner of social media, right? Uh, because it, it's maximizing quote unquote engagement uh, in terms of the click throughs on advertisements and so on. Now, uh, granted, I've talked many times to the civic integrity team within Facebook. So uh, there, there are people within the Facebook machine uh, that want to um, steer uh, it toward purpose. But as a profit-seeking entity uh, with some purpose, uh, when those two different bottom lines compete with each other, the uh, easier route is always that profit motive wins, uh, even at the danger of their users, uh, just like some other industry which also has users. Uh, and so well, what I'm trying to say is that uh, when we make sure that these, uh, I think the, the jargon is dark patterns, right? Those habit forming patterns uh, are revealed uh, as harmful to mental health, to societal health, uh, and so on. Uh, we basically treat them as the, the nightclubs uh, of the digital sphere. That is to say, um, so, so with all due respect, we're not shutting down the nightclubs. Uh, but again, we're not steering our young people to it uh, to conduct uh, town halls, right? We have dedicated places for town halls. It's called a town hall. Uh, we have public parks. We have campuses. We have um, parks and national parks. And these these also take infrastructure money uh, to build. Uh, so in 2016 in Taiwan, uh, for the first time, we said that even the infrastructure made out of bits, not out of concrete, even it's, it's intangible, it qualifies as infrastructure money uh, of a special budget. And this is very important because previously the state only sponsors the infrastructure for things that you can see, you can touch, uh, like a public park uh, or a town hall construction. But now we say things like join, things like the Civil IoT response platform, uh, and so on, uh, all those digital places where people meet, along with civic infrastructure like our equivalent of Reddit, the PTT, uh, where people discovered the um, COVID uh, in 2019, actually, uh, and triaged that message simply because PTT is not for profit. It has no shareholders or advertisers. It's for purpose, right? So those for purpose civic infrastructure and those public services 
service public infrastructure if they receive the same kind of funding as the state does uh, for um, science and research and public uh, sector and so on uh, and maintained then people understand okay for for my kids uh, maybe in the uh, weekend we'll take them to a museum we will not take them to a nightclub uh, to do uh, a mayor or conversation mayors would not be forced uh, to give their public consultations in a nightclub where uh, the smoke fills the room you have to shout to get heard people serve addictive drinks there's private bouncers uh, and so on but at the end of the day we're not shutting down the entertainment sector we are just saying that there should be a plurality of sectors within the digital realm mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so I'm in charge, as I mentioned, for uh, social innovation. Uh, and I work, I personally incubate uh, the social entrepreneurs. And the social entrepreneurs are there uh, for purpose, but with profit. Uh, so purpose first, before profit. Uh, but the idea of social entrepreneurship, uh, as you mentioned, actually is only possible if the state is willing to entertain the idea that for some of the public services, the civil society and the social entrepreneurs may actually do better. Um, as one very concrete example, as you can see here in the uh, 192 SMS example, here the 15 digits uh, are, are entirely random. When you go into, I think this is a 7-Eleven, uh, your phone transmits this 15 digits posted by 7-Eleven into your telecom. So 7-Eleven doesn't know anything about you, not even your phone number. And your telecom does not know what those 15 digits mean. Right, so it's what we call a multi-party oblivious uh, storage. Uh, and your telecom and many other people's telecom and so on, uh, they store them in a federated fashion. They do not aggregate it anywhere. And the only person that can aggregate it uh, is the epidemic control contact tracing people. And they must do so by leaving a complete record. So anyone can just go to SMS.1922 and look at exactly which municipalities, which contact tracer have accessed your whereabouts in the past 28 days. Uh, and we delete everything after 28 days and it's never used for any other purpose. Um, in many jurisdictions, uh, Singapore comes to mind, uh, but also Korea, um, the crime investigator try to get their hands uh, on this data. But but because in our case, the system is designed by G0V, by the social sector, by the civil society people. So there's already surveillance resistance built in. And because we adopted this civil society innovation, uh, we uh, honored uh, their original intent and we interpreted it saying that it should never be used for criminal investigation. Actually, it should not be wiretapped at all. Uh, and we did that interpretation very quickly after a judge turned down the first search warrant and then went public about it, whistleblowing that is to say. So um, again, I think this is a virtuous cycle uh, when we take the civil society input with privacy enhancing technologies, it sets a better norm. Then it encourages the whistleblowers uh, within the public service, including judges, to go to the media. Uh, and then it enabled the media to crowdsource for even better, more private enhancing solutions, which were then taken into the government. But the government must begin first. We must trust citizens first. Hope that answers your question. Mm -hmm.
Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. It's actually very easy. Um, so the, the way we worked uh, is always swift and safe. Uh, I spent a year when I was 11 in Germany and my mom used to drive me around on the highway, the Autobahn, uh, in Germany. Uh, and it's very well known for having no speed limits. And I was fascinated by this concept of having no speed limits. Uh, and uh, I asked my mom, uh, would not it, it cause accidents and so on. And she explained uh, that if you have really good infrastructure, not just the road, uh, but also the car, not just the car, but also the requirement it takes on the drivers. Uh, and so on. If everyone is in line, then actually the faster you are, the safer you are. So, uh, and this phrase stuck with me, right? So uh, basically, uh, I would not uh, trade uh, efficiency uh, with uh, security. I would never introduce something that make the bureaucrats feel less safe, just make the politicians feel that, oh, it's more effective. Conversely, I would not uh, do anything that just to make people feel safe, like a security theater uh, and so on, but actually uh, increased the workload for everyone. So you need to be uh, Pareto improvements, right? Things that are at least as safe and uh, as swift as the status quo. And then we very gradually do incremental um, delivery so that at every given time uh, of the, the day, uh, the bureaucrats and the politicians that look at our solutions can simply say, oh, it's harmless, right? It's mostly harmless, uh, harmless coexistence, and that is the, the trick. So instead of doing any top-down planning, as I mentioned, this is entirely crowdsourced, and I'm always ready to say, yeah, that my idea is, is a bad one, and you have a better idea, and here is the blueprint, go and fork uh, my work. Uh, and so by co-creating with the people, not just for the people. In a sense, we are the resistance, right? So we do not encounter any resistance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. I am uh, very inspired by uh, Tom Attlee. Uh, I work with him face to face also and the dynamic facilitators and so on. So I see myself just really assisting the facilitators not taking over. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, in Taiwan, uh, we say the more rural you are, the more advanced uh, you should enjoy uh, the technologies. Uh, when we allocated, for example, the 5G uh, spectrum auction, we make sure that for the uh, universal health care, in Taiwan it's a very socialist, uh, like single payer, covering even dentist visits, uh, health care service. Uh, the same for education uh, services, including homeschooling uh, community, which enjoy exactly the same right uh, as the basic school uh, community, uh, as well as 
as the communication and democracy and things like that. So uh, in Taiwan, we have a very strong socialist core, uh, like a parallel core, right, to the small and medium enterprise and uh, the TSMCs of the world uh, that are uh, in parallel to each other. And we always make sure that the latest technological innovations, even before they find a market fit in a profit-based capitalist world, can actually find its pilots in one of the more rural areas to prove uh, that, for example, drones uh, delivering uh, drugs is a good idea or not, uh, or uh, making sure that uh, telemedicine uh, visits enabling local nurses and general practitioners uh, to do even uh, more complicated diagnosis with the help of the telecare workers and so on. Again, we bring all of them uh, first to the places where it's more um, unequal, uh, which requires uh, the kind of justice uh, to restore their equal opportunity. In Taiwan, we have 20 national languages, many of which indigenous, and our latest AI, assistive intelligence research in natural language um, processing is applied to ensure that the legislators and city councillors can interpolate uh, with their um, native language in any of those 20 national languages. I can go on, but uh, as you can see, uh, those startups that solve those social inequality issues enjoy the first mover advantage because if we compete on a purely for profit motive, the, the market is simply not there yet, right? So we, we foster this kind of social entrepreneurship market as a pilot tester, almost like a sandbox, and they gain kind of exclusive access of a set of interpretation as long as they can prove it's for public benefit uh, for six months or one year and so on, uh, technically exclusive. And if we discover that this interpretation is actually a bad one, then we thank them for their contribution and everybody, uh, no harm done, uh, the risk is uh, not that much anyway, uh, and then people learn to approach the problem in a very different way. But if it does work after three months or six months, then through mechanisms such as presidential hackathon, uh, five teams each year receive a presidential trophy, Shape of Taiwan, with a microprojector underneath it that you can turn on and it projects Dr. Tsai Ing-wen giving you the trophy, so it's very meta. Uh, and Dr. Tsai Ing-wen promises you on that uh, video recording within the trophy, uh, saying that you embody uh, the plural uh, values of Taiwan, and I will make sure that your idea become uh, public policy within the next fiscal year with all the personnel uh, and regulation and budget support. Uh, and so it's like scaling out immediately to a national level if it proved to have a societal value. So a parallel track for innovation that drives the innovation on the enterprise side. And I think uh, this is not that particular to Taiwan. I think, uh, for example, Japan with Society 5.0, with strategic zones, and so on, are trying uh, uh, quite successfully from what I understand the regional revitalization based on the same idea of social innovation driving industrial innovation. So I do believe it's uh, a model that is worth spreading. Thank you.
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, um, the answer is that I'm I'm non-binary, right, and not just in gender, uh, in everything. So, um, and and this is important because uh, binary thinking, that is to say, friend or foe thinking, uh, dominates uh, the kind of politics that leads to zero sum answers and is a self-fulfilling prophecy. Now, uh, in Taiwan, we're enjoying a very different constitutional design. Uh, I'm a double appointee, meaning that uh, people elect the president directly. Uh, and then the president uh, nominates um, the premier, the prime minister, and then the premier nominates the ministers. Uh, and so uh, in the cabinet at the moment, uh, we have nine um, ministers with a portfolio, meaning a large ministers, uh, and I think seven of us are nonpartisan. Uh, and within all the ministries, uh, I think there are more nonpartisan independent uh, members than members of any party. Uh, but that's not a, that's not true in the parliament, not in the legislative branch. Of course, there's the usual party politics going on there. Uh, but right, but having the executive uh, branch uh, staffed by mostly nonpartisans enable us to work in a politically neutral zone. Uh, and unlike m most other designs of constitution, most of the drafting of the law are proposed by the executive branch, not by the legislators. Uh, and then the legislator, of course, uh, do the amendments uh, and the changes and so on uh, in their usual way. But the structure, the, the formulation uh, of the laws are, I think, 90% or so are from the cabinet, which is nonpartisan uh, by and large. Uh, and so um, I think this is something that uh, we see in other jurisdictions that's only possible if you have a, I don't know, citizen's assembly, a citizen's jury or things like that, that are kind of a addendum, right, to the parliamentary politics, uh, but by nature then it becomes competitive in representative power. Uh, but in Taiwan, because the executive branch kind of serves as the buffer zone between the civil society on one hand, uh, the movements, uh, and the legislature's partisan politics. So uh, we get a lot more room to maneuver. Uh, so that's, uh, I think, quite fortunate that we have this double appointee design free from the party politics. Sure. Uh, sure, sure, sure. Uh, yeah, well, my, my website, easy to remember, is digitalministry.tw, uh, and there's uh, a lot of blogs and so on uh, on this particular matter. And also feel free just to, I don't know, tag me on Twitter, send me an email. It's very easy to find. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, um, as I mentioned, uh, I see um, Internet of Beings, not of things. I see collaborative learning, not just machine learning. Uh, in all of the events that you mentioned, I see plurality, uh, not singularities. That is to say, when I, when I say plurality, uh, I mean um, allowing, even empowering uh, groups to reach rough consensus with 
proliferating and persistent difference. Uh, and this is uh, a very different, I would say, is a, is a distinctly Taoist view uh, on things, right? Because if you're uh, following a, a set of traditions or a set of dogmas and so on, then uh, diversity or tensions or conflicts and so on can feel like setbacks if you're aiming for a particular direction of change. But uh, as I often say, uh, in Taiwan, uh, we're hit by earthquakes all the time with Eurasian play on one side and Philippine Sea plate on the other. Um, the Japanese people know what I'm talking about. Uh, and then uh, whenever there's an earthquake, the, the tip of Taiwan, the Jade Mountain, also grew. Uh, every year we grow by like three centimeters. So I see tension, conflict, and so on as necessary for people to feel the co-presencing, the, the in-here-togetherness, because without such shared urgency, uh, people's energy would not be able to contribute uh, to co-creation from a plurality. People just disperse and do whatever they're doing. But with this shared urgency, we now see uh, people believing that democracy is not on the backslide after all, uh, that it means something uh, to be part of the democratic network, that it means something for liberal democracy uh, to uh, hold its own values, uh, and that it's not out of date, but rather it can actually create um, innovative ways of not just spreading the words about any particular war, uh, but actually about uh, discovering new ways to counter uh, even the most urgent uh, pressures such as uh, net zero uh, together. So uh, I think the, the wind is changing. Uh, democracy, instead of being seen as relatively less efficient or effective or simply out of date, are now being renewed and people are asking a different set of questions like how can we make it more timely? How can we respond to each other's needs in the here and now? And so on. And all this because of the urgency, especially the war uh, that you just mentioned. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, um, I think there's uh, the, the the trap right of trying to maximize automation of trying to extrapolate the volitions of the current generation uh, and make a single optimizing paperclip stuff <laughs> out of it, right? So it is a very strong uh, kind of solutionism uh, spirit uh, in some part of the tech, not necessarily technology uh, sector. Uh, but I think we're now, uh, because faced with real urgency, uh, all those simple optimizing visions pale in comparison with the complexity of a pandemic and infodemic and a war. So <laughs> within the past couple of years, we've seen that this dominating singularity is here. Um, a conversation losing its potency uh, a lot uh, in everyday people's conversations. And even terms like surveillance capitalism cease to be a purely academic thing, right? People are uh, weaving this uh, into their daily conversations also thanks to um, like the social dilemma and many other popular videos about this particular topic. So this optimizing mindset, uh, whereas many, many years ago, like seven or eight years ago, I would say it's the main trap, I think, uh, is no longer uh, as is insurmountable as it is, is now. I genuinely think that people are now really looking at plurality as a preferable outcome to singularity. So I, I do remain uh, cautiously optimistic uh, that we will be able to use this digital to connect all, right? As the all uh, in digitalization is to leave no one behind.
like in addition to you know randomly sending SMS uh, to Russian telephone numbers. <laughs> uh, so uh, I think uh, what what I'm uh, trying to say is that. Uh, 40 years ago when I was born, uh, Taiwan was still in the martial law, right? It's very much an authoritarian um, kind of uh, continuation of a dictatorship uh, in Taiwan. And I uh, can say, because my parents are both uh, journalists, uh, during the martial law era, uh, my earliest memories uh, are around censorship and political control and surveillance and things like that. Now, uh, so I can say with quite some confidence that in a authoritarian regime, what people say to the posters may not be what they believe. Uh, so take those poll numbers with a heavy grain of salt, <laughs> because people just say that to be safe. Uh, and then, um, but even with that in mind, uh, in Taiwan, we, we do rely uh, at that time, for example, on international correspondents in Hong Kong, uh, who are paying a lot of attention to the human rights situation in Taiwan. Many underground reporters, journalists, uh, have to go a very um, kind of roundabout way of sending their reports and testimonies and so on to Hong Kong uh, in order to get the Amnesty International and other international correspondents uh, to actually see what's happening in Taiwan, and then it goes back uh, as a uh, foreign report uh, to, to the Taiwanese population and so on. So Hong Kong uh, played a very important role role uh, in the democratization uh, in Taiwan. Now uh, it seems the roles are reversed uh, and then we uh, are of course hosting a lot of journalists uh, which are previously based in Hong Kong, uh, international or Hong Kongese uh, journalists. So we, we do need uh, to double down on journalism, on independent reporting and media, on um, ensuring that the underground activists uh, are equipped with not just journalistic training but also journalistic um, technologies, uh, things like end-to-end -end encryption that can protect themselves uh, against um, the coercive uh, forces in a hostile uh, environment. Uh, and with sufficient practitioners on journalism, I, I do believe that the truth will get out, not just to the international community, but also to the people living in authoritarian regime uh, themselves. It may look uh, soft, like a soft power, uh, but I do believe that at the end of the day, uh, truth speaks louder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, so basically to communicate safely, uh, we have the we have the Electronic Frontier Foundation uh, along with many others, right? Who are working uh, very closely uh, to make sure that they can get the voice out. Uh, it goes to some details, right? Like um, not just encrypting your disk uh, in a full disk encryption, but also have a separate set of password, the rubber hose password, uh, that if you're under uh, violent coercion, you just type in that password and, and it just erases everything and presents a safe environment and so on. So there's many um, technologies uh, for people working in journalism, uh, in reporting in a hostile environment. And in my previous life around the turn of century, uh, I collaborated with the Freenet uh, community to work on those technologies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Well, prior to entering the cabinet, my previous job, day job, uh, was uh, with the Siri team uh, working on uh, cloud service localization in Apple uh, for six years. Uh, and so we're uh, in an assistive uh, community, right? Assistive intelligence community. And uh, uh, whenever the the people who cannot uh, use Siri uh, to their liking, it's always the designer's fault. It's never the people's fault. That's the nature of assistive uh, technologies. So uh, I am a fervent believer in the assistive paradigm in the sense of technology fitting the people, not the other way around. And I design uh, my public service projects always with input uh, with my parents who are around 70s and my grandmas who are around 90s and so on. Uh, and I would um, actually say they are very familiar and comfortable and not, not just because they're my uh, parents and grandparents, uh, but because uh, we design with their input in mind. Uh, it's not that it's about old or young, it's about how many hours did they spend as fellow designers, as fellow participants and contributors, as makers, essentially. Uh, if you get them involved in the design of uh, digital services as early as possible, they have very much a lot to say and a lot more time on their hands since they're already tired uh, to, to try out different things. Uh, my grandma, uh, 90 years old, for example, uh, suggested a bunch of her younger friends around 80 years old uh, to try out our uh, mask creation in pre-registration system and we designed uh, initially to use debit card in the ATMs within all the convenience stores and you can just insert your debit card type your password it will wire a trivial amount of money to prove that you are you uh, and with the receipt you can redeem for the pre-registered uh, mask it all works very quickly now the grandma young uh, one of the uh, around 80 year old friends uh, who uh, to my grandma is a young friend, uh, tested that and said she would never do that because she used an ATM just to withdraw cash. But to wire anything out, she always resort to pen and paper because she don't want her typos uh, to end up, you know, wiring out her entire saving. She feel less safe. So although it's swift, it's quick, it's not safe. Uh, and with her input, I always say, okay, so if you're the digital minister, what would you do? Uh, and Grandma Young said, oh, just use our universal health card without um, entering passwords uh, and because it has no uh, accounts associated with it so she knows that it's safe and if you need to pay well she will count in coins right uh, around the corner uh, in the counter so the point here being that nobody imagined a ATM like kiosk can insert a um, health card but it's they're all typically IC cards. The IC chips are in the same position. So with some firmware and software changes, it actually can be done. Uh, and that's exactly what we have done. So then uh, Grandma Young convinced all his, all her younger friends around 70 and 60 years old in the community because she came up with that idea. So by amplifying the wisdom of the elderly, we ensure that they become the early adopters. And once they do that, they actually are very influential uh, in the community when, when they convince their their uh, younger generations, they carry still the, this family um, kind of authority, right? So just to involve the elderly as much as possible early on, so they uh, lock in more hours into the co-design, co-creative mood. And I guarantee you that they will be as comfortable as the young people. Thank you. Yes. Um, of course, I, I always emphasize uh, Taiwan's uh, liberal democratic 
tradition, right? The, the liberty uh, of uh, according to the Freedom in the World and Freedom on the Net uh, survey in Freedom House, uh, we're, we're really doing pretty well uh, in terms of civic uh, space. So having the civic space in the first place is a condition, right? The, the liberty, the freedom is like a uh, operating system on top of which democracy flourish. Uh, but if you do not have this underlying operating system, then uh, indeed, as you said, uh, that if you try to run the software, there's simply no uh, no RAM <laughs> for it, right? The, the, the kind of working capacity uh, is not there to support this um, kind of upper level uh, application. So uh, when, when I was a, a child at a time, there was essentially not so much political freedom, certainly uh, no freedom to form uh, opposition parties uh, in Taiwan. So uh, my mom uh, worked instead uh, to get the co-ops movement uh, on the way. So she uh, co-founded uh, this homemakers union uh, to popularize the idea of now they will call it circular economy, uh, and then uh, to contract uh, the farming producers uh, and so on in a consumer co-op uh, fashion. So uh, by focusing on the consumer rights, by focusing on getting the messages out around the correct labeling, uh, no pollutants, uh, organic farming, and things like that, uh, in she possesses no harm, no threat uh, to the dictator, to the authoritarian uh, regime. Uh, but it's very much uh, possible to amass uh, social legitimacy this way. Indeed, the largest Taiwanese charities like Ziji and so on uh, all began uh, even before our first presidential election. Uh, but still today, if you have a local earthquake and the charities publish a number, the municipalities publish a number, people still believe the social sector's number, right? So this sort of legitimacy, focusing on uh, not politically um, like controversial, but rather nobody can argue against consumer right protect, uh, protection, right? Uh, and so then uh, using the same techniques of voluntary association, of nonviolent communication, one can actually get a legitimacy in exactly the same way as we practice now in uh, digital democracy. So digital democracy is not a public sector only thing. People can do that in social sector as well. And in time, that will also power the sort of digital democracy that we've been talking about, but this time powered by the social sector.
Well, it's science fiction, uh, but but uh, reality sometimes are even more imaginative than science fictions. So, um, so but to answer your question, um, so a, a website uh, to a refinery is not the same as the refinery itself, right? So um, it's very easy uh, to shut down a website to a refinery, uh, but it's very rare for a refinery to be powered by its website. So uh, in uh, technical terms, the information technology and the operation technology, the IT and OT, uh, are not necessarily tightly coupled, meaning that uh, to, to deface a website does not translate automatically to the red button uh, access. On the other hand, um, getting the website access can uh, enable people to get uh, insider information. Maybe there's uh, a kind of uh, contact addresses or whatever internal emails and so on uh, that can then enable uh, what we call social engineering, right? So uh, basically the, the more regular person-to-person uh, -person, uh, way to con your way basically into uh, getting access. Uh, but that is not just by uh, running programs alone. This is just uh, making sure that uh, people can um, get the kind of insider information that are kind of prerequisites of starting such person-to-person uh, -person operations uh, by themselves, right? Um, and so uh, actually one uh, I alluded to, right, there was a leaked uh, SMS uh, contact uh, database of Russian people and uh, there's a website that enable pretty much anyone using your mobile phone to send random uh, anti-war messages uh, to a uh, mobile phone number uh, in Russia uh, set up by uh, the the, the sort of people uh, that you mentioned. So um, to, to me, it's um, in a neutral term, it's direct action, right? Not uh, waiting for anyone to kind of go to a multilateral uh, setting and say anything, but rather take some of the matter uh, to their own hands. Uh, but most of what you read on science fiction uh, are not uh, currently uh, possible, uh, but um, reality has a way to be more imaginative, so I wouldn't say it's never possible. Thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, I, I didn't get the examples. They send out paper postcards because the post office ensure everybody received them in the same day. Okay. Right, 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 right. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, but yes, but, but it's a great example. So um, one can, for example, say that we ask a post office uh, to deliver uh, the snail mail, <laughs> the, the paper mail uh, to uh, all the uh, recipients uh, and this Sunday, for example, and then you send an email that Sunday afternoon and, and problem solved. So <laughs> I mean, the, the, so for, for me, harmless coexistence means that it's swift and safe, right? So if it disadvantages people, we can always turn it into an advantage. I have a, a anecdote about postcards. Um, in Taiwan, 
Taiwan, uh, we, we used to uh, require the people who apply for the uh, reimbursements uh, for COVID-related uh, sufferings if they're low or mid-income or their income gets impacted by the COVID, uh, they can redeem uh, $10,000 NT dollars by proving uh, that their income is uh, being, being harmed uh, by the COVID. The first time we did that in 2020, uh, people lined up at the desks uh, of the local health and you know, welfare offices and uh, uh, workers are simply overwhelmed and the new Taipei city even uh, transported boxes and boxes of uh, forms uh, to the central government uh, and say you designed this form, you must type it in because we're simply overwhelmed. Uh, I'm sure Japanese people know what I'm talking about, right? So, uh, so after this uh, initial foray uh, of paper-based forms, uh, we switched very quickly to postcards and by uh, last year, 2021, we switched entirely to postcards. Now, um, if you're a lower median income person uh, and you don't uh, want to file your uh, application online, all it takes uh, is to ask your local district office or any of those uh, self-service printers in all those 12,000 convenience stores uh, to print a postcard with the postage stamp already prepaid. Uh, and then you just fold the A4 paper uh, two times uh, and with a photocopy of the envelope uh, of your bank account uh, and sign your name and presto, you just put it into a nearby uh, like post box. Uh, and then um, something magical happens, right? It's aggregated into a post office. The people who are suffering from handicaps of movement are pretty good typers, uh, gain employment by typing in uh, those postcards. And very quickly, they get aggregated uh, into the digital uh, websites as if uh, these small medium uh, income people have filed those website applications themselves. And if they have a debit card and if they're a parent for example, they can also use a ATM and type the um, health insurance number and just withdraw cash, right? So well, what I'm trying to get at uh, is that digitalization doesn't mean paperless. It means uh, to make the possibilities swift and safe. People feel safer when they don't have to queue in line, especially during time of COVID. Uh, and the people feel that it's safer when they can just count the, the, the bills right at an ATM or uh, get, if they don't have a debit card at all, if they don't have a bank account, then at least a check right is mailed right back uh, to whichever address they write on the postcard. And uh, the desks on the local welfare office is no longer swamped because they're not even open <laughs> to receive applications. So the, the point I'm, I'm trying to make is that digital transformation uh, enables all the touch points to innovate, empowering the people closest to the pain, and they get the freedom to innovate, uh, to solve the issue at hand, instead of waiting for somebody at the central government uh, to type in their forms and so on. And uh, uh, only by making sure that the underlying bedrock systems are secure and resilient and offer a set of APIs like uh, wall sockets, right? Uh, can those startups, those innovations and so on plug in safely uh, and to basically deliver the service in a way that's more pro-social than anti-social, uh, whichever the emergent situation is. So that's my anecdote about postcard and about reading <laughs> reducing inequality. Uh, and I think uh, my uh, grandparents, for example, all very much appreciate that uh, my digitalization strategy doesn't involve abolishing paper forms in post offices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's forced digitization, right? Uh, and and the root cause is definitely the virus, not the bits. Uh, in, in Taiwan, uh, even at the height of our only real wave, the alpha variant, uh, the school never closed to the disadvantaged children. 
even when we move some of the classes online just for a couple months, uh, the disadvantaged children can always go to the school uh, and participate using the computers and facilities there uh, with proper uh, precautions and support, of course. And uh, it also prompted us to begin this uh, uh, September, this semester, uh, to adopt a way for those disadvantaged children to also bring those uh, iPads and laptops home. Uh, so previously, they have to go to school because our um, zero trust cybersecurity wasn't all, all, all the way there. We rely on a kind of internal network uh, to keep them safe. Uh, but we've uh, doubled down on investing in that sort of cybersecurity arrangement so that we're now pretty sure that they're safe around the edges. Uh, so whereas, of course, all children enjoy the use of laptops and iPads if the teachers uh, see them as complementary, we're not replacing paper-based textbooks if the teachers and parents are not uh, comfortable with it. But the disadvantaged children, including uh, a medium income uh, family with like five children, uh, they can all take those uh, laptops and iPads home, I think, beginning this September. Thank you. Taking this as a compliment. <laughs> uh -huh. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, yes, it's very clear, and, and it's a is a really deep philosophical question. Um, that is to say, uh, how can we design uh, public service such that people who want to maximize their private profit nevertheless ends up maximizing purpose? So uh, it's like the holy grail, isn't it? Right? If we if we solve that, we solve pretty much everything. Um, and and uh, I I do have some contributions, uh, but I would say it's better practices, not best practices. I don't think anyone claimed to have best practices uh, in this regard. Uh, I, I've consistently discovered that if the business community are operating under a very clearly defined social norm then they would not even attempt regulatory capture because it does not pay. But when there the social norm is being hidden by the polarization and party politics, then it creates opportunities for the private logic to dominate the public one. So I call the model that I'm building in Taiwan a people-public-private partnership that began with the people 
for example, people occupying the parliament uh, nonviolently uh, to set a norm around the 4G infrastructure adoption uh, from the PRC regime uh, components, or uh, people occupying the national auditing office uh, to do direct action and bring out Xerox copies of uh, the campaign donation and finance record, which used to be kept on paper only. Uh, but the GovZero people, the activists, uh, made a game where people can solve CAPTCHA uh, to turn individual cells uh, in that huge spreadsheet uh, back to structural data uh, so that the campaign donation and finance can be republished to investigative journalism as uh, public open data. Now, the National Auditing Office, of course, protested, saying you can't be sure it's a, a correct uh, character recognition, and which GovZero responded, that, that is why you should publish as structured data yourself, right? So, uh, and then that creates such a strong social norm that the National Auditing Office actually had <clears throat> to publish as open data. And once they do in 2018, the investigative journalism community discovered that uh, Facebook advertisements were not filed by pretty much any candidate on that year's election as a donation or expense uh, in that record, uh, which is to say you can actually pay from outside of our jurisdiction uh, to bypass fact checks through advertisement to influence the election uh, without uh, being captured uh, by our National Auditing Office. So uh, then we went to Facebook and other large uh, platforms saying, OK, our domestic platforms all agreed uh, to conform to this National Auditing norm. Uh, and it's not a government ask, it's the social occupiers ask. So if you do not uh, conform to our local norm, uh, you may face social sanction. Chances are people will uh, socially sanction Facebook uh, because people all already know that it's a problem thanks to the media uh, journalism community. Uh, so um, I think the, there was a whistleblower who quit Facebook. I think she was in the civic integration uh, integrity team who said Facebook had to take selected jurisdictions very seriously uh, because the social backlash threat is, is uh, cogent, right? Uh, it's true. Uh, so uh, then and they actually did uh, reveal as open data in real time all the social and political advertisements during the next election period leading to 2020. And also they bond um, all the campaign donations uh, outside of our jurisdiction as well at a loss uh, of their advertisement uh, revenue. So this is just one very small anecdote, but it shows that the government is much stronger when negotiating with a profit-seeking entity, when the trade negotiation has the people on your side. And you can say, is, is our people forcing me uh, to do this trade negotiation? That's what I mean by people, public, private partnerships. Thank you. Thank you, it's a great question. Um, I see AI as assistive intelligence, and by assistive, I mean aligned and accountable. By aligned, I mean uh, that this glass is aligned to my personal interest of wanting to see you better, more clearly, but its job is not to replace my eyes. Uh, and it's accountable in a sense that if it's biased or broken, uh, I can fix it myself. I can take it uh, to the local um, repair person down the street. I do not have to pay $3 million of licensing fee or spend three years to reverse engineer it. So just so that it does uh, not project uh, advertisement to my retina, right, which would not be aligned to me. It would be aligned to the advertisers. So uh, a, a very simple example of a eyeglass uh, as assistive uh, technology showed that we need to treat AI, hold them accountable and aligned exactly as any other form of assistive technology. Uh, and if we do so, so that it protects the dignity uh, of the citizens instead of treating them 
just as users, uh, then it will enhance the possibility of creating better jobs that leads to more satisfaction because you can then delegate the part of the uh, mundane task that nobody wants to do anyway to those assistants. But if you do not have the local tweaking control, if the innovation is not open, is not aligned to you, uh, then actually it's uh, the other way around. It becomes authoritarian intelligence uh, where individuals become replaceable as soon as their uh, data is surveilled and gathered and their pattern of repetition being learned by the algorithms and then uh, all the creativity from the uh, person doing the job disappear and then become entirely automated. So it's a, a conscious choice that uh, all the jurisdictions can do. Uh, and I believe that, for example, the GPAI, uh, many international organizations around AI are now converging on, on such uh, pro-social data coalitions or data altruism organizations and so on that has a very specific purpose-based direction for AI-based uh, research and uh, funding. And if we collectively decide to stop funding <laughs> the dark patterns of authoritarian intelligence, then I'm not worried about it uh, making the jobs even less uh, welcome and even less enjoyable for human beings. Hope that answer your question. Yeah, uh, I think there's real danger when we speak of the metaverse or a metaverse. Uh, because that to me is uh, the singularity mindset, right? Uh, that we will have to conform to whatever social norms that's set by uh, Zuckerberg or some other metaverse making person. Uh, and uh, I think the real danger uh, is in the spontaneity of social interactions uh, being dominated by uh, the prescribed uh, interaction patterns uh, by what, whichever person uh, that creates the rules that on, on top of which the so-called metaverse uh, operates. Indeed, uh, that's what the novel Snow Crash is about. In, in Snow Crash, where the word metaverse happened, uh, the reality is so bad, it's entirely dystopian. Nobody wants the reality anymore. It's very violent, very fragmented, and so on. So people escape to the metaverse because the reality was really, really very bad. Uh, and then uh, people escape to the metaverse and then the rule makers like hero protagonist um, who, who know how to make those rules uh, gain a uh, distinct, uh, unalterable advantage by being a uh, what we call OG, uh, original gangster <laughs> in the making uh, of the metaverse, right? So, so this is a really a dystopian novel. I, I don't know why nowadays people are selling it as a utopian uh, vision. So. <laughs> 
what I'm trying to say is that the, the vision of plurality uh, that I have is co-creational and inclusive, uh, which means that is a extension to the plural relationship that we already have that we can then shape uh, however we want. Uh, we can build our own uh, microcosm. For example, I used uh, shared reality uh, in 2016 to talk from Paris with a bunch of middle and uh, I think primary schools uh, students in Taiwan. And I shrank my avatar, it's on an entirely open source platform. I shrank my avatar to the same height as they are and toured the schoolyard or whatever uh, with them uh, and then don't have to look up to me, right, because I became the same height as they are, uh, and in a kind of familiar avatar, and then they can uh, treat me as more like a peer-to-peer -peer relationship. I put myself in their shoes, so to speak, and there was another project uh, where we work with elderly in Kaohsiung, uh, and then we uh, made their avatar resemble their youth, uh, and then uh, in the shared reality, they traveled down literally in the memory lane uh, and served as guides uh, to the local young people on how the streets look like uh, during the Japanese uh, era uh, in Taiwan and so on. So what I'm trying to say is that if it's a shared reality that's defined, including interaction norms, by the people who want to share their reality, their ambience, then it's conductive uh, to more face-to-face -face sharing and more connection between groups of people. But if uh, both sides, instead of end-to-end -end innovation, need to conform to the norm of an intermediary, then exactly the same problem of surveillance capitalism happens, except, of course, maybe tenfold uh, as more serious. Uh, so we need to really actively resist any singularitarian vision of metaverse and em uh, embrace instead a plurality, or as some of my friends say, a pluriverse. Hope that answer your question. Yeah, there was a last question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so make, make, make it quick. How about it? Yeah, OK. Yeah, but all my civic tech friends, people who work on democracy affirming technology, see that urgency uh, as a kind of wake up call. Uh, and they're m now much more energized. And frankly speaking, receive more funding <laughs> because of that event. So uh, I, I think I'm still very optimistic in the uh, US being an open experiment, admitting to its mistakes and correcting them in the open. At least it does that, right? Uh, in the more authoritarian or closed uh, countries, uh, they do not admit mistakes, right? And e even uh, after they do, they try to uh, solve the people uh, who bring those news instead of uh, the problem itself. So I, I do think there is uh, every opportunity for the people who work on democracy enhancing technologies and privacy enhancing technologies to thrive uh, in the US, not because US leads the world in terms of democracy uh, and liberty, but because it has a self-correcting in the open culture uh, that we are seeing unfolding uh, right now. So I'm still pretty optimistic uh, and let's just work with them together. Mm hmm mm hmm mm hmm sure. Yeah, I always quote Lena Cohen, so I'll do that now again. So, ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There is a crack, a crack in everything, and that is how the light gets in. And thank you for the great questions. Live long and prosper. Thank you.